Hello, everyone. This is Ted Gothier with Michigan CNC. We want to thank you for uh, joining us tonight for our online webinar. Tonight's topic is going to be uh, the Vetric Users Group that we attended in Chicago in October. There was, uh, I guess, five or six of us from the Michigan group that attended the uh, Users Group. And tonight we're just going to have a roundtable and talk about uh, our thoughts and what we found interesting, what we liked, what we didn't like, and uh, just uh, just do a little bit of a roundtable. But before we get going, I just want to uh, mention a couple of things that uh, uh, I'd like to uh, bring to everybody's attention. Uh, number one is that uh, I want to remind everybody that on November the 17th in Grand Rapids, Dave Van Antwerp and Curtis, um, Curtis's last name. Oh, uh, Curtis's Damn last. Okay, and um, they're putting on a uh, CNC uh, workshop or seminar um, over in Grand Rapids. You could find that on Michigan uh, CNC router tips um, Facebook page, and all the information is there. And uh, I think it's only twenty-five dollars. And if you want to go. Um, feel free to uh, give them a jingle, and um, they would love to have you. Um, and then the second thing I wanted to let everybody know is I've been recording these uh, webinars because it seems like everyone wants to have a link of it and find out. I've even find myself uh, going back and reviewing some of the stuff that we talk about. So I started a Facebook page, and I all of the – oops. I'm trying to get this over here on the screen. And it's not one. Maybe I'm not dragging it far enough. Ah, let me make it smaller and see if I can get it over there for you. Um, there we go. It's probably going to come now. Okay. So this is it here. And uh, I guess the easiest way to find it is just when you go into YouTube, just search. Michigan CNC webinars and tips, um, and then you can find it. And I put all of the uh, the interesting ones. That I'm, I'm going to try to uh, put them all up there from now on. So tonight, uh, video is going to be recorded, and uh, if you want to watch it right away, I'll try to send you a link. But within a day or two, I'll try to put it up here on this YouTube website, and then that way you can go to it and watch it anytime you want. But uh, all this week, I uh, was busy cutting all the cabinets for my kitchen. I'm remodeling my kitchen. So I had to, uh, I didn't have to, I wanted to cut all the, all the cabinets uh, on my CNC. Well, I only have a four foot by four foot CNC. So I had to take the full sheets and cut them in half and put them on there and then um, they were all designed using the software Cabinet Sense, and uh, Mike Samarza, he was so instrumental. He's the expert in Cabinet Sense, uh, and he helped me uh, get through that program. And once uh, we got all the cabinets all designed, then we exported them into Aspire, and we used the nesting uh, feature in Aspire, and um, and then we uh, nested them on the four by four sheets. Well, one of the big problems of trying to cut cabinets on a four by four sheet, or actually on anything, whether it's a four by four or four by eight, is the hold down. And I think we all find that to be a problem. And uh, having a hold down uh, for a cabinet is essential because there's really no place to screw through the cabinet. You don't want a hole in the side of your cabinet. Um, there's a couple of spots where there's some screw holes that go through right on the side, but you don't really know where they're at until after they're drilled, and then by that time, the other program's running. And bottom line, the easiest way is to have a vacuum table. So there's really only, that I'm aware of, really only two ways to do it, have a vacuum table or have tabs. Now, I had eight cabinets that I had to cut out and you know I'm doing a top and bottom and sides on each cabinet so there's a lot of parts so if I was to do tabs my goodness I probably spent three days I would have to spend three days 
just cutting out tabs and sanding. And then when you go to do edge banding, if your side of your part is not sanded perfectly flat, then your edge banding is not going to lay flat. So I really didn't want to use tabs. I wanted to use vacuum table. So I went to this vacuum table webinar that we had um, posted, and uh, I made three individual vacuum plates. I made one was 24 by 24, one was 18 by 18, the other one was 18 by 18. And I ran a shop vac to each one, so I had three shop vacs running. I put the 4 by 4 sheet on top of those three vacuum pads, and it appeared to hold. Um, however, when I did the profile cut, if the part was perfectly on that one pad, then that part you'd lose and it would go flying. So the three individual pads just did not work at all. So my next plan was to go ahead and I made a complete four by four vacuum table. I took a big sheet of melamine and I cut two inch squares all the way around it, gasketed it out, put three holes in it, ran three vacuums in it, and, and then I took a piece of MDF, put it on top, I edge banded all of the uh, melamine so that there was no air leaks around the outside of it. Um, took a piece of MDF and I cut 30 thousandths off of the top and the bottom and laid that on top of the vacuum table and the air sucked right through it and held that um, four by four sheet down and I was able to cut um, my cabinets through that. Still had some issues. Um, here, here's, here's what I found. I found that it was fine if I had four parts or less. If I had a sheet with nine parts on it, or I had a sheet with five or six parts on it, by the time it did the profile cut and went all the way around the part, of course I'm using a half inch uh, end mill to uh, cut the profile, so it's leaving quite a wide gap all the way around, right through to the through to the spoil board, right? So wherever you are cutting around the part, now you're opening that area to lose vacuum. By the time I get to the fourth end of the fourth part, now you start losing parts and the vacuum table will no longer hold. So that's a real problem. So I just figured out that, hey, you can't cut more than four parts on a sheet. But other than that, I would say 90% of it worked just fabulous. And if I had to do it again, I would just make sure I didn't have too many parts on a sheet. And that creates a little bit of problem because then you have waste. But when you want to make a vacuum table for under $30, uh, that's what you get. So then the one last thing that happened with the vacuum table was uh, the uh, quarter-inch melamine they used for the backs of the cabinets. That vacuum table was not strong enough to hold the quarter-inch stuff. The quarter-inch stuff, you would think it would pull it down easier, but... There's a uh, flex in quarter inch melamine. And, um, the material is not flat, it's very warped. So I tried putting it on the table and then threw a sheet of three quarter inch on top of it to use it as a weight and then turn the vacuum table on and then pull the three quarter inch weight off of it and it just wouldn't hold. There's just too much tension uh, in the warp to hold it down. And then after talking to uh, Mike Samars out in California, who has a big legacy, um, what's what's the big legacy, uh, uh, Don? That starts with a G. The uh, I can't remember, but it's uh, five by by nine or something. Yeah, like. a big monster machine, and uh, he has a big uh, professional vacuum system, and he said he doesn't even use his to cut his quarter inch sheets. He just cuts it on a table saw. So that's what I ended up doing. I used my Festool track saw and I just cut up those out in the garage. So the reason why I'm telling you this story is just to give you some information about my vacuum table and experiences this week. But um, I wouldn't have had the confidence to build one if I hadn't went back and watched this video again. So these videos up here, they're all up here and, and you can go there and click on them and and find something that uh, is interest of you, and uh, they're there. So I just wanted to bring that to your attention. 
So any questions about, and then the last thing I would like to talk about before we get going here is, uh, uh, has anybody got anything that they did this week or this last month that they want to talk about and share? That's uh, off topic of uh, what we're going to be talking tonight. What's everybody been doing? Jim Sensicola, you've been out there in the shop quite a bit the last month, haven't you? No, I've been watching a lot of uh, metric uh, tutorials. Oh, I thought you were going to tell me you were watching football. No. <laughs> okay. Not at all. All right. Well, let's let's go ahead and uh, talk about uh, uh, what we all saw at the Chicago. Uh, users group. Um, forgive me if I miss uh, somebody's name that was there, but John, you pronounce your last name Frankfurter? Frank Forther. Forther, okay. And then Dave Dietrich and Don Batts and Rich Kruger and Rich Fosmo. Yep. Who else? Did, who else was there that uh, I missed? It's Rich Cryer. Cryer, okay, that's how you pronounce. You know, I always butcher your last name. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, Rich Cryer, he, he was there. So, um, and these guys are all with us here in the in the room tonight. So, um, just going to be an open forum. Let's let's go ahead and uh, look at these topics here, and we'll we'll talk about them. We can talk about anything else you want to talk about too. But um, just thought we'd have a little outline here so we could follow. But uh, the simple uh, design. Um, that was, uh, let me bring that up for you. I think I got it here. Um, while you're doing that, let me talk yeah. about the costs for people who didn't go. Yeah, why don't you do that? Costs $190 for the two days registration. What that does is supplies you with four meals, two breakfasts and two lunches. Uh, you're on your own for dinner at night. We were downtown Chicago on the Miracle Mile. So you'd walk outdoors, do a 360, and you could see 20 restaurants. Um, the cost of a room at the Embassy Suites on the Miracle Mile was $232. That Ted and I split, so it cost us $116 for one night plus $190 for the uh, two days of instruction, plus we went out for dinner on Friday night. So <clears throat> it wasn't like going to one of our local meetings, but uh, you had national level people. Uh, a very nice hotel, very uh, big breakfast and lunch and snacks and ac <clears throat> access to Wi-Fi. Uh, one of the coolest things other than <clears throat> meeting just about everybody who works for Vectric um, was the level of the people that were there. Boy, were there interesting people there. Uh, uh, an opportunity to make great contacts. During breaks, there were probably about uh, half a dozen or so uh, major vendors, and then there was plenty of uh, show and tell where people left things out on the table, and you could marvel at it. I thought it was, for me, a very entertaining and worthwhile weekend. I'll uh, stop there. Why don't we go through and uh, each guy give their opinion. I'll I'll go next. Uh, yeah, I thought it was very uh, entertaining, worthwhile. I was glad I went. Um, I was uh, really impressed with uh, the quality of. Uh, 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 knowledge that was there. I mean, just about everybody from any walk was there. Um, 
And you could talk to them and ask them questions, even if they were a speaker. I mean, uh, Jimmy DeResto was there, and uh, you could walk up and even talk to him. It was, it was kind of nice, although he was being swarmed by a lot of people. Uh, but, uh, yeah, it was I, – I was uh, – there was – a lot of information there that really I did, wasn't that interested in, but there was information that I was, and I think it's really hard when you have a big seminar like that to have something that's interest to everyone. You know, you can't have every topic that's interesting to everyone, but overall, the way we did it, the way that Don and I did it, I thought it was very reasonable. You know, if if I had to do it all on my own and pay for a room and, and all of that, I don't know, it, I'd have to uh, see how my finances were at the time. But, uh, yep, I, I really liked it. I'm glad they did it. I was glad to see it was in Chicago, um, close by, instead of having to, you know, go clear across country and then have an airline ticket. That that really saved a lot. If I think if I had to pay for an airline ticket on top of it, uh, I may have to uh, reevaluate whether or not I would attempt. One thing that was really nice and we didn't mention is that the very first thing that they do is they give you a thumb drive with every single file of every um, guest lecture. So um, whoever was speaking and whatever topic that they were talking about, um, they gave you a thumb drive with all that, all those files and a video of how to make it. So uh, that was really, I think that was, uh, real key part of of going and made it work more worthwhile don't you don in fact that's what i was going to say next those vectric people are all professional speakers there wasn't an um or an ah or a pause for two straight days they know how to lecture they had excellent audio visual they gave you all the slides that they projected. They gave you videos of the project and all the files of the uh, finished project, including the tool paths. So they're very organized. Yeah, and there wasn't a single speaker that I saw that uh, wasn't willing to share what they had. And like you said, they were very professional. So if someone else wanted to uh, step in that was there and talk about uh, uh, this is John. Okay. This is John. Um, I thought it was pretty decent. Uh, the, the, the two large TV screens made made it very, very easy to see what were what they were talking about. Um, my wife and I went, so on the expense side, it was a little more expensive for me. I uh, really had a really hard time trying to get out of town after I left, but, you know, that has nothing to do with the the Vectric software. The uh, people that uh, that were presenting, they were real easy to go up and talk to. Uh, granted, they were overwhelmed by everybody wanted to ask them a question, so you know some things didn't get answered. Uh, I did get to talk to Nathan from CNC Router Parts to see what kind of uh, add-ons that they were talking about, and they're talking about a fourth access to uh, add to the machine, which was kind of nice. Uh, also, seeing like they said, uh, everybody had their their projects out to where you could see it, uh, ask questions about it. Um, all in all, I thought it was a really decent uh, setup. Um, first time I've ever been to one. Uh, my expectations were a little different than than what actually went on, but uh, you know, it was well worth it. The uh, the projects they were talking about, the thumb drive. I think it was well worth my trip to there. Very good. Rich Fosmo? Um, it's, it was, I've been to a couple of them. It's much, this event was much larger than the year before in Las Vegas or two years ago when I was in Vegas. And um, one thing everybody should be aware of is they rehearsed this at um, another event in May in uh, South Carolina. It's um, the, I forgot what his name is. It's McGrew? McGrew's uh, camp 
can. I would highly recommend if anybody could be, if they could make it. It's not, um, it's about $100, um, at least the three times I went um, to go there. But they don't give out the videos, but they walk through all the stuff, and you wouldn't believe everybody brings their GoPro cameras and records it, but they walk through the exact same stuff that is done. So you get a preliminary um, what you see in May, and then you get the professional version in September or October when they have it in uh, in the the Vectrix um, camp or whatever. So um, I would highly recommend going to that. They're gonna they rotate by the way the camps on the East Coast and West Coast every other year. That's what their intent was or is, and hopefully it'll be somewhere closer than like Las Vegas that was two years ago. Okay. So, uh, so uh, this is the third event that you've gone to. So evidently you feel like you're getting a lot out of these events. Yeah, you get, you get the, the presentations are really worthwhile, but also in McGregor's a lot of the people bring uh, a lot of their samples and get you get to see what pe other people create. Um, it's not just it vendors. So it's, uh, they spend, it's a three day event, Thursday, and um, sorry to go off topic, Thursday is more uh, suppliers and bits and hold downs and stuff like that. And then Friday and Saturday is a combination of Vectrix people giving presentations and then other people giving presentations what they do on um, with their equipment or what they do with VCarve or Aspire. And then back to the three places I went to for the Aspire camps um, events, they they were much smaller. They're growing faster and faster. The one in Vegas was less than a, um, 200 people. They clamped it down. And this was, what, 310? So it's getting much, much larger. It'll be interesting to see if they're going to, um, you know, keep it this large or go larger. I thought yeah. I heard it was supposed to be, they're trying to work uh, getting it larger yet. Hmm. I think they're still planning on doing a Florida and a Vegas to keep it going around the country and, and move it around. So, like, next year would be in a in a different spot, you know. So they yeah, it would be, like, the third year and come to uh, Chicago. Right. They're also trying to – they realize going to Vegas, airline expenses are very inexpensive. Same thing with Orlando. That's why when I talked to one of the guys, that's why they were going between Orlando and Vegas because the flights are so inexpensive um, for most people. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Dave. Uh, it's hard to come up at the tail end here, but because a lot of it's already been said. Uh, I the presentations covered a wide variety of things. And while there were some things that I was particularly interested in, I found that I was most interested in stuff that I taught. I had about, particularly the one about mapping um, and uh, the opportunity to talk with a whole variety of folks from all over the place. Uh, was um, I think uh, I, I really wish that the lot of free seekers at this was available at all the medical meetings I went to for the last 40 years <laughs> because these, these, these guys are fantastic. Uh, this is first season I long really uh, a bummer of a lecture, and while I may not have been particularly interested in it, the material was presented in a, in a interesting and concise and 
that, that you know made you think a little bit outside uh, the boxes that you were normally in uh, in terms of the uh, accommodations we were pretty uh, I, uh, downtown Chicago to be about as expensive as it was. The one thing that kind of got me was the $47 a night parking thing. Um, uh, 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 you know, we had, we had a good time, uh, saw lots of stuff. Uh, I, I think the uh, being able to have all of this talk of meant you didn't have to try and keep up with anybody. And so I ended up with just a notebook full of notes about different kinds of things. And I wrote down a few websites, uh, but they, yeah, uh, I, I think they really did a pretty good job. And I, I'm really impressed with the quality of the, uh, the presentations, even the ones that I didn't think I would like. Again, the, uh, and uh, for me, that can be kind of a big thing. I I have to agree with you. Um, that, like I had mentioned earlier, there's a lot of topics, not a lot, just a couple of topics that I really had no interest in. Um, and, and the mapping, I really didn't have any interest in that. But I really did find it interesting to watch, even though I had no interest in. And then on top of it, uh, what's very nice about it is they give you, like Don said, they give you the slideshow and they give you a lot of files so that, who knows, in six months or a year, I may want to do it. Matter of fact, I um, I know uh, Charles Ireland does a lot of mapping for his lakes and stuff, and I would like to maybe someday do, do my lake. And, um, you know, it's nice that maybe you're not interested in right now, but you could go back and review it. And uh, and find that information. Uh, the parking was an interesting thing because yeah, it was forty to sixty dollars a night for parking. But it was at Rich uh, uh, Fosmo that found parking across the street for fifteen dollars. Yeah, that's I looked online and got uh, parking space, and it was fifteen. Yeah, we and we when we walked to dinner, we walked right past it. It was just literally basically across the street. So if you know where you're at and what you're doing, I guess you can uh, you can find a deal. Uh, Rich Cryer, um, what did you think? Kind of the same thing as everybody else was speaking. I said some of the topics didn't really interest me. It seemed like the lasers are kind of the big push lately, but with the speeds are getting on them, I don't know how you could make money with them to be able to do things. I have a, a real uh, a laser machine separate. And just the speeds are very slow. I don't know how they would you'd make money out of projects if you were to do anything with the lasers. Yeah. I thought that was kind of uh, something that's, I think it's up and coming, but technology is still pretty new that I just don't see how you can right. make money with it. Um, right. Well, um, I, I agree. The speeds are very slow. Um, I don't know if you, uh, everybody was online we were talking before we started about um, Jay uh, Johnson is uh, going to be our guest uh, instructor next month. So for the December uh, online webinar, he's come from JTech. He's the owner of JTech, and he's coming online here to uh, talk to us about lasers and installing them on a CNC. And... Um, uh, I agree with you. I think they're way too slow, and it's not anything that you really can make. Maybe you can make money with it, but um, I ended up buying one of his. Um, I just got it this week. Um, it's a 7-watt laser, and uh, I really look at it as just a marker, just something to do marking with. I'm not planning on using it to do any cutting or anything like that. I would just like to be able to put my logo on some of my projects and do some basic marking and I'm not in any big rush. And uh, I think uh, if you really wanted to, to get into laser and do a lot of work with it and try to make money, I think a freestanding one is a, a better way to go. But, you know, his to buy every single thing you possibly need and want from him, the total bill I think was, for me, seven hundred and ten dollars or something like that. That was for a seven watt laser. 
Um, I don't know how well that you would see it on here. I can grab it. Um, one thing that's nice about it is it's, uh, it's got a magnetic housing with it, or magnetic clip, and you can put it on your machine, and um, it magnetically fastens there. Let's see if I can hold this up. So it's not very big. I don't know how that focuses, but I'll get my hand out of the way here. But this is the uh, shield, the uh, orange shield that that is totally encapsulated in the laser, so that this thing comes down. And I guess it's mounted on, so it's like within an eighth of an inch of your board. So you really don't need to be wearing glasses because it's all in a it's all in a case. And then when you're not using it, you take it off and put it in a pouch so that it doesn't get all dusty and and um, damaged while you're you know you're cutting with your CNC. But I haven't installed it. I haven't put it on. My hope is, is that I get it installed and and working uh, before next month so that I can give my input of how it was to uh, install the tech technical problems that I had with it. My my unit's gonna be a little bit challenging because it's not one of the machines that list that he lists as uh is retrofitted to to his laser. Although he says it shouldn't be any problem. I've heard that before. So we'll see. Um hopefully it'll go smooth and um he's got the ribbon cables and everything there so we'll give it a whirl. But um like I Mentioned earlier, I think if you uh, really want to get into lasers, uh, do what I did. Go to Makerspace and join Makerspace. <laughs> that way you can get yourself a really nice laser that doesn't cost you hardly anything. They proved that to me last week. I uh, went to Kalamazoo Makerspace and I had a, a couple of cutting boards that I wanted to put Pure Michigan on and laser. So I brought them with me. And, uh, uh, they put them on there, and I think my bill is just a couple of dollars, you know. So it costs you 40 bucks a month or 50 bucks a month to join the club, and and then you got a laser that uh, is together. So if there's a maker space in your area, or uh, you're only using it once a month, it may be worth the drive. So um, that's that's my input on the on the laser. We want to talk a little bit about, uh, let's say we've got uh, 20 minutes, 15, 20 minutes. You guys want to talk a little bit about uh, some of the uh, things that they showed. Um, I can bring this over on the screen. This was uh, one of the guys that uh, was one of the speakers. And uh, the Hyde design. Now, Don, wasn't this one of the guys that this was his first project? Yeah, I asked him a question. He showed that thing, and he said, well, this is my first uh, paid project. And <clears throat> you can see how big it is, and you can see how it hangs uh, up in the ballroom of a gigantic San Francisco hotel. There's nice. there, right there, yeah. How in the world did they give somebody that project who had never done anything before professionally? I said, did you know somebody? And he said, yeah. Basically, he was one of the Burning Man people, and he knew people at Burning Man, and so they gave him the job. And then there was even a bigger job by a lady down in Texas. She had never done anything professionally. And she got <clears throat> contracted by the Yeshiva University in Jerusalem to do a replica of a frieze done in marble on an arch in Rome. And they gave her the STL files, <clears throat> and she did it in HDU. And uh, she had to have a 18-wheel truck deliver the HDU to her house. And then she ran her machine, and I, I just couldn't believe this. She ran her machine for 41 straight days without stopping. I, I've never heard of stepper motors and 
whatever that can do that. But that's the lady in the picture there. And again, I, I just have to assume she knew something because that must have cost tens of thousands of dollars to do that. That blue thing you see on the screen is a 10 or 12 feet wide, eight feet high, and uh, two feet thick. So there were some very interesting people giving uh, talks there. And she had to do the slicing uh, technology to uh, get that to be that thickness. So she had talked about slicing. Let's see, there was a little note here in it. First slides that they gave to us, here it is, slicing and importing uh, 3D models. So in order to get the thickness, she cut a sheet and then she cut another sheet and cut it and then she glued it all together and this thing was gigantic i just can't imagine what that cost you know to uh to make that part i wish they had a picture of the uh the whole thing but it wasn't in the program but uh yeah that was i found that very interesting i think she had slides of when uh when she was giving the presentation, but I don't think it was on the, the thumb drive. Yeah. yeah, she had slides there. So and then who was the people with the terrain map? Uh, that was, uh, who who was the guy that was talking about that? The terrain map, okay, here, I got it. Uh, right here, carving terrain maps. This was, uh, like I said, I wasn't real interested in doing this myself, but I found it the, the, this talk very interesting. I did that in May for a friend at the Makerspace. He was Latvian, and Latvia had their 125th anniversary uh, in June, and he wanted to bring a terrain map of Latvia three feet by five feet, which is the limits of my machine, and wanted it to be five inches thick. Well, by the time it rolled around, I got him down to two feet by two feet by two inches, and he brought with him on the airplane, so nobody would mess it up, pink foam to keep the cost down of the entire country of Latvia, which he could identify all the valleys and the mountains and the lakes. So you can get very interesting uh, triangle mesh models off of the internet of your favorite place in the world, and you can carve it in peak foam like that picture is showing right there from uh, Home Depot. Now, isn't this the, the uh, website that... Uh... They recommended to go get the uh, STL files? Yes, and I don't know where .io is. Yeah, he said it's a very different uh, internet address, but that's the address right there. And uh, I guess you can get terrain maps from all over the world uh, from there. And I think there are several of them that he gave, several uh, web addresses, different ones you could get. Well, he put them all here in this slide presentation, so I will uh, see he went and got this one of Mount St. Helens, and this was the uh, web address that he, and this was interesting too, huh, Don, that he made a little plaque here of before the eruption and after the eruption and how much it took away. Another thing that was nice, uh, at the meeting is they kept repeating some of the shortcuts you use on the keyboards to uh for uh in the vcar pro and yes i found it very helpful one of those or a couple i'd like to mention three of them if you point with your pointer at an object and highlight it if you hit the number nine you rotate it to the left if you hit the number zero, you rotate it uh, clockwise. And you can hold a control or shift and decrease the increments of, of uh, degrees of rotation. 
And then another one that was really slick was you can highlight a line, and if you want to extend that line, you hit E. Now, when I came home, I couldn't make that work, and I tried today in the new version that just came out, was it 9.511? Yep. Yeah. I can't seem to make it work there, the E echo command. And I went into the quick tips where it gives you uh, keystroke combinations to do things in single letter. And the letter E was not listed there. So I don't know if that's an undocumented uh, single key thing, but somehow you press E and you can extend a line uh, to meet another line. Now, they had an interesting uh, conversation about uh, going out and finding grayscale uh, stuff like the, like the rooster and a couple of different things outside the mapping. And, um, was there a link to, to go get that, or was it, did they just talk about uh, how to take a grayscale and make it into uh, um, import a grayscale? Go up two slides or three slides, right there. Right here? Right there. Go into Google and search grayscale height, and that's the critical word, maps. And what that does is give you an image that is vectorized X and Y and Z. And you can create 3D models from a vectorized thing for free on the internet. Yeah, so that's, we found that's that really out. cool. Yeah, that's, that, that was worth, just finding that out was worth the entry fee right there, I thought. Because... Now, you know, you see guys on on uh, the forums all the time and say, hey, do you have this 3D file of this or that? And uh, people have it, but it's not accurate. If you were to Google search this and, and use grayscale height maps um, or height in there, you would get that rooster if you wanted it. And, it's, and the Z height is already... Uh, figured out it's all equal so you can uh, increase it and decrease it for scale which I find very uh, you know helpful so uh, then they had uh, demos of lakes so, so you know uh, that uh, I found that very interesting there so that was that was good um, Michael Tyler's project, Light It Up. What do you guys think of that? I wasn't interested. It uh, He went through a lot of techniques. I probably would never make that model or try and light it up. Uh, it just shows that that guy is real skilled. And he's one of the two guys who gives the monthly free project. So I memorize his name. And if it ever came up, I'd probably take a look at it. Yeah, I, I, I'm with you. I had no interest in that, in that design or that model. But, you know, he always does fabulous work. And this was a, a thing that's uh, in this month's metric. Um, all of, I should say all of these, a lot of these projects that they did at the show are in this month's Vetric, uh newsletter that they tell you how to make and are free. So um, I was looking for a picture of that lighted up. I guess it's not here. Didn't you have a picture? I think one of the things that, I think one of the things that, huh. uh, school that is, getting you to think about using other kinds of processes that are that are real familiar to to your uh prior stuff uh some of it's finishing uh methods 
are a bit unusual, but uh, the, the what he gets out of them are uh, uh, they're really kind of nice. They're, yeah, I, uh, I, it, it's more I, and what he what he told me that he's trying to do is get people uh, see their projects in you know, different ways to finish them, different ways to put them together, um, and that sort of thing. And I. You know, some of us probably, but he always has, you know, it's the way he finishes or goes about putting them together that, uh, that I think are, are. More well, he has some, he has some classic designs, Well, we already talked about, uh, Jay Johnson and the laser, um, He's going to be our guest speaker next month, so if you want to know more about that. Uh, but, uh, you know, he, he went through and talked about, uh, you know, his laser technology. And uh, this is this is the laser right here. So we won't, we won't harp on this anymore because next month that's what we're going to be doing. But um, I thought it did this kind of thing, marking... Marking wood, I think it does very good. Um, I don't know about cutting. He had examples there of stuff that he cut, but I don't know how fast it would do it. Some of this stuff he was, uh, he said they had to go through two or three times, you know, to make it go all the way through. The foam, I guess, goes real through really easy. And he had some nice displays of powder-coated etching on powder-coated and... Um, Ionized, uh, anodized aluminum. Um, they looked really well. So. so we'll talk. This was the cutting board we talked about earlier. I don't know. I, I think we talked about it before the uh, we turned on the recording. But the cutting board is a. Uh, uh, I think this is all done in laser, is it not? But they had a cutting board that they cut on the CNC and then they filled in all the darkness with the laser and that's where I think um, a laser on a CNC would be really beneficial. I see two areas that a laser on a CNC would be very beneficial. One is to keep the registration. So you cut a project out, you still have the registration and you can um, go back and laser around where you cut out. That's That's number one. Num number two, I think, where a laser on a CNC would be very beneficial is it allows you to have a larger uh, work area. So if you've got a four foot by four foot machine, you can laser something that's four foot by four. You got something you want to laser on one end and laser on the other end, and you need to keep it in registration. Um, having it on the CNC would be great where of most uh, that I've seen, anyways, affordable anyway, and I say affordable, three to three to five thousand dollars. They're not large enough to stick a big piece of wood in them. Uh, a lot of them have an opening where you could slide a piece of wood through, but if it's too wide to get in there in the first place, um, that's where I can see a laser could be beneficial. So uh, they did give us the files to all this and. Um, yeah, see, they carved it out with uh, the CNC. They did the carving, and then they went in with the laser, and they filled it all around the uh, the checkerboard or the chessboard, and made the chessboard like that, which I thought was kind of a cool idea and a and, and a good uh, way to use it. I don't know how easy that would be. I'm not that familiar with lasers. How easy that would be to get that all lined up if you took it off a CNC machine and tried to take it over to a laser machine to do that. But the one thing that they didn't talk about was how long does it take to do that? Kind of like some of these projects, uh, you know, they talk about how nice it is, but then they don't tell you that it takes five hours to run that project. Okay, we just have a few more minutes, so let's see what else on the topic. Uh, next fab um, and then CNC router parts. They both talked about uh, the rotary on a CNC 
machine. He's just developing it. I don't think he has it for sale yet, does he? Yeah, yeah. I think it's going to be fifteen hundred. Yeah, but it's not. It's actually just they're developing it for a CNC router parts machine. I think. You know, I've got a little bit of experience with rotary, not a lot. Probably Don's got more experience with rotary than I do. Um, I've cut a dozen things out on my rotary, but um, I, I think the big problem with rotary is that uh, uh, when you have rotary, it's the software, and that's where you have the problem. You know, um, everybody can make a rotary, but trying to get that software organized is... Uh, is real, real a real challenge. It's it's a it's a learning experience for me. I'm I'm gonna just say uh, on my end, and maybe I'm just uh, not that much of a techie guy, and I and I try to be, but uh, I think it's much a challenge as trying to learn a spire all over. So to try to learn rotary is a whole another network of knowledge, you know. So well, then you have to take into consideration how much slop you have in the rotary itself, whether you have the, the geared, uh, the gearbox version or the belt version. Yeah. Well, ideally, you have no slop. And if you yeah. have slop, you got other issues. <laughs> so, well, um, we're, we're coming towards the end here. What I would like to just, uh, whoops. Uh, what I'd like to just say is, uh, is there anything else that uh, you guys want to talk about before we, uh, Close this down. Okay, I think we covered uh, pretty much all the topics. Um, overall, sounds like everybody had a great time. Um, I would go back. I definitely would go back. Um, it, if I had to pay for an airline ticket on top of it, I'd have to uh, try to uh, really check and see where I'm at financially to see if it was worth it. But um, certainly if it was in Chicago and certainly if it was only two or three hundred dollars for an airline ticket, I'd probably, yes, I'd probably go. Uh, it was, it was that beneficial. And it was, uh, like I said, I think the nicest thing about it is that they gave, they were so willing to share the information and give you any, any questions you had. And, uh, I mean, I just was tickled, think, uh, tickled just to even meet the owner of Vetric. I didn't even know there was an owner of Vetric. And he's a very quiet guy standing over in the corner, and you go talk to him, and he's a real nice guy. So um, he just kind of like stands in the back, back, uh, back way and lets everybody uh, do what they're knowledgeable at. So I think it's a great company, and, and I was glad that they reached out and and are doing these user group uh, uh, seminars. Looking forward to the next one. Okay, guys, let's wrap it up. Thank you for attending. Hope you can join us next month when we have uh, uh, JTEC Photonics on, and we'll be talking about lasers. And uh, if anybody has a guest instructor or someone that would like to share something, I'm always looking for topics and for people to come on on and uh, help us uh, get a little bit of uh, education here on learning more about CNC. So thanks again, and uh, hope you guys got out and voted, and uh, be safe. Have a nice uh, month. Take care.